Yeah, good afternoon, everybody. We are already on the final straight of the OpenSUSE conference 2019, slowly heading towards the finish line. My name is Axel Braun, and I will tell you about demystifying FUDs. So, what are FUDs? FUD is an acronym that stands for fears, uncertainty, and doubts. And these fears, uncertainties, and doubts are usually spread by interested parties in order to make you scared to change away from their products and away from their services. There are many thoughts around free software in the market because free software is also a game changer for established companies. And uh, in this case, it's just a threat to their business model. So, um, Everybody is mostly okay if uh, free software is somewhere in the server room. I mean, the internet as we have it right now would not exist if there is no free software. So as long as it stays somewhere on a very technical level, everybody is happy to, with it. But as soon as it gets up into uh, closer to the, the user or closer to the business, then the people get scared. So next to my uh, board hat from OpenSUSE, I'm also in the core team of the GNU Health project. And this is one of these typical um, business applications that are highly affected by the spreading of FUD. So GNU Health is basically um, an ERP system, enterprise resource planning system, that allows you to run your business, or in this case, your practitioner's office uh, or a hospital. So it consists of uh, various layers. We're starting with person and community. So all the stuff that uh, you just need to identify a person, his lifestyle, where he lives, and what conditions, and so on. The next layer is typically uh, covered by so-called AMR, electronic medical records systems. This is the layer when a person gets sick and enters a practice or a hospital. Everything that has to do with the person, with uh, timings, with uh, analysis and so on. Then we have the ERP layer, the, the management of the health institution. So that can be a laboratory information system, that can be a pharmacy, uh, stock keeping, financial accounting, and all that stuff around. And on the last layer, we still have some additional functionality for uh, health authorities, respectively the Ministry of Health. And this allows the, the ministry, for example, to uh, run vaccination uh, campaigns or uh, analysis over the health of the, uh, of the people. So if you want to know more about this, uh, take a look at the presentation from Luis Falcon on the very first day. He was talking about federated networks with GNU Health. So GNU Health as such is such a free software. It's an official GNU package and it uses uh, basically only uh, free components um, running on uh, Linux based systems or BSD. Uh, it uses the Postgres database, it's programmed in Python, it sits on top of the uh, Triton ERP framework. Um, it uses GNU PG, for example, for encryption, for death or birth certificates, or, or digitally signed uh, prescriptions. So many programs that you can get, especially for your cell phone, are gratis, but they are not free. Gratis means you don't have to pay with it in the first glance, but if you look closer into it, you are mostly paying with your data for it. But free, in our case, means really free. That means it offers you the four freedoms to run, as you like, to distribute the version or the copy of the program that you're currently having, to help others and learn. So you can drill into the software, analyze the code, and change it by yourself. And you can uh, distribute the changed source codes to give it other to give it uh, to others and to improve the program. So some examples, um, I think these are 
some of the finest programs in the world. For example, the Firefox browser is still my favorite after so many years. Um, KDE Desktop, uh, for my personal feeling, is one of the most flexible and ergonomic uh, desktop environments that I can think about. Postgres database is definitely something that is enterprise ready, and LibreOffice provides you basically with all the functionalities um, that you need. There are many other applications um, available as free software. And um, nearly everybody uses it in between, even our so-called competitors. If you think about, for example, the uh, Amazon, uh, which is uh, looking for new stuff over here, they are a heavy user of uh, free software. But for example, even Microsoft is using Linux in between. Otherwise, their cloud uh, service Azure would, would not uh, work. So, but nevertheless, I mean, I'm coming from the business consultancy side. I've done enterprise architecture, IT strategy, and something like that, and talk quite regularly to people on the C level, so CIO, CEO, or something like that. And if you, when you talk with them about free software, uh, you end up in some popular so called FUDs. One of them is, well, free software, hey, this is something, this is coded by nerds in their back room and uh, the pizza slice on the keyboard and uh, what I know. Well, yeah, maybe. Um, I don't know about your uh, office uh, situation, but for some reason this may be true. I mean, many people or many projects started very small with a single person. Linus Torvalds was a student at that point in time. Richard Stallman started with his GNU utils, um, also very much alone. But as soon as the software was released into the wild, there was really a big momentum where others were picking the software up and uh, were trying to improve this. So nowadays, we have already the case that many big com companies contribute to free software as well. Of course, mostly because they need it and they can take advantage of it. IBM, for example, has bought Red Hat for the small amount of $34 billion. So if somebody like IBM is paying $34 million, I think um, we can be sure that there is a market for free software and that they're somehow trying to monetize this to get the money back. So. Free software is only coded by nerds in back rooms. I think this is wrong. Another one is uh, the quality of code is low. You see the company XYZ, uh, they are the market leader and their software must be good because they are a market leader. Well, is the quality of code better because a company has a high market share? I would say no. Um, there is a company who does regular um, code scans, they're called Coverty, and uh, they have analyzed proprietary solutions as well as open source software. And what they found is the amount of uh, bugs per line of code, and if you see this here, uh, proprietary software has mostly 50% more bugs in it than free software. And this is... Uh, Quite simple, maybe this company has 50 developers, but a free software community may have 500 developers looking at the same piece of code, and then it's quite obvious why, why bugs are found more often and quite quickly. So, that the quality of code is low is definitely wrong. The quality of code in free software projects is mostly higher than within commercial projects. Another thing that scares people, especially on the CIO level, is that, well, if this is free, that means everybody can change the code. This is complete anarchy. Anybody can change anything. And uh, this cannot be good. So, what is the fact? The fact is that, first of all, most uh, all projects basically use version control systems, whether this is Mercurial or Git whatever. So within this version control system, you can identify basically any change that has to be has been made. 
organizational. A project mostly doesn't allow, uh, I call it a newbie, somebody just coming in to get in, hey, you're now becoming a core committer and uh, you can improve the code. No, it needs trust. Even here in the Zuse community, where we have a so-called duocracy, um, those who do decide, you can do anything what you like in your own home repository. But as soon as it gets into a development project, then there are the maintainers of this project who are reviewing what you've done uh, in this package before it gets submitted into OBS. And they make sure that the quality is right. The next step that you then have to take is when you submit it to factory. There are even harder checks for this. There is a lawyer who's looking over it to make sure that this piece of code that you're submitting is under the right license, that it is a free software license and put not the whole project into danger because it con contains some uh, proprietary code. All right. So, um, before the change really gets into the core, there are a couple of reviews. You can do what you want at home where nobody is looking at you, but definitely not in the project uh, that you are uh, committing to. So this fact that everybody can change anything is uh, definitely wrong. So once you have the system up and running, you need support. If you buy software from a vendor, you have exactly one vendor from whom you can get support. Free software, due to the fact that it's free and if you share knowledge, it gets more and not less. In a free software project, you usually have more than one vendor who uh, can look into the code, who can provide service, and you have the freedom to, choice your, to, to, to choose your software partner here. You are free to select the vendor from whom you want to gain your support. Additionally to this, we have various models of collaboration, for example, the freemium commercial model. That means the base of the software is free. If you want additional features, uh, you have to pay for it. And uh, by this, the, com the, 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 the company as such gains income. So that there is no support is um, definitely wrong. On the other hand, what I would like to add here, if you have a commercial company, and I'm talking about really a, a big software vendor at the moment, it does not necessarily mean that due to the fact that you pay a high amount of money, and we're talking here about 22% of the license fees annually for maintenance cost, that you receive a good service. So I have at the moment a high priority ticket open with this vendor, um, which affects basically the whole material requirements planning when in, within one of the production plans, which is not working properly under certain circumstances. So it is really affects uh, the stock level, this affects production. After three months, they have not even finished the, uh, the analysis of this bug. And I cannot say that this is a service level which is worth 22% uh, license fees annually. So, another popular thing, free software is unsecure. <laughs> so, first of all, uh, yeah. In free software, we usually don't have a, a, a threat by patch days. If you're a Tumbleweed user, you know that uh, new software, including patches, comes around mostly every day. In some cases where OpenQA test fails, uh, it takes a little bit longer. That means uh, we have maybe only two or three days where we get af after which we get again uh, uh, an update. Um, if the software is disclosed or if, if the code is not disclosed, is it more secure? Well, in general not because this security by obscurity has never really worked. And this is the reason why we still see so many uh, so-called zero-day exploits uh, that affect um, especially users of a certain desktop operating system. Let's call it that way. <laughs> So, yeah, take a look at the bug slide. 
Um, another thing is that the free software community mostly reacts much faster on new threats than commercial vendors. So this is also a, a situation or a fact that Coverty has found out. So in average, the Linux kernel developers need six days. If you think uh, one week back, we had the so-called zombie load bug, a new bug uh, affecting Intel processors. Uh, the patch was available af one hour after this bug was released. One hour. Now it needs to go into the, to the kernel maintenance cy uh, cycle and will be available quite shortly. So, free software is unsecure? Definitely not. So, another thing, um, common sense. You know maybe your aunt or grandmother says, oh, what nix cost, that is all nix. What costs nothing is nothing. Yeah, I would say the best things in life still are free. So just the fact that you're not paying license fees up front doesn't mean that free software doesn't cost anything. So if you're introducing software into a larger scale into your company, then you're affected basically by the similar or the same cost blocks that you're having uh, when you're introducing proprietary software. So that starts for the costs for, uh, for, for introduction of the software and consulting. So usually if you don't have the skills by yourself, if you are not willing or able to build them, you can buy them on the market. So you need to have a couple of consultants come in to run the project. If you have a project, you need some project management. Project managers usually don't work for free as well. Um, <laughs> 25 years ago, we did a software evaluation um, for a production planning and control system for a customer. And uh, we asked various software vendors for a request for information. And uh, we got from one customer, the an or from one vendor, the answer back, our software is highly customizable. There is no additional development needed. <laughs> yeah, we're laughing loud, and in fact, you basically need small adaptions. And if there are only, if this is only the layout of the invoices, the additional header, the footer, or whatever, you always need some small developments or larger developments in your in your in your software. And here, you of course have to pay for it. When you introduce it and it's new to the people, you need to train them. Training costs money. Once you're in the stage that you finished all your building, you go to testing. The so-called user acceptance test to make sure that this is what you are introducing is supporting your business. So the, so the users and the key users need to run through test cycles. That binds their uh, workforce. That means um, we have some uh, costs here as well. And finally, we need to have some kind of documentation, documentation where you can look up what the special customizing for your company are. Finally, once the software is introduced, you have usually two weeks, four weeks, eight weeks, so-called hypercare phase, where the project team stays on site and makes sure that upcoming issues are solved in, an, uh, in a quick time. And after this hypercare phase is finished, you hand this over to the maintenance team. And yeah, maintaining a running software is also something where you have to allocate a little bit budget for. So basically, um, we have all these cost blocks as well. But finally, we have no license fees. Not only license fees and all the mess around it. To give you an example, uh, the German government pays annually 250 million euros just for desktop licenses. And they're not really sure whether this is the full truth or not. So to have a little excurse into licenses, um, if you look at licenses of commercial software vendors, not only the end user license agreement, which you always click away when it comes up during installation, 
you find out that these licenses are quite complicated. There are companies specialize on consulting in license questions. This is not something that you read uh, right after dinner in the evening. Right? To make sure that you are paying license fees in a proper manner, the software supplier is doing audits every now and then. So they come along and do metering, say, oh, you have uh, registered 2,000 names users, but we see 2,500, so please pay. Oof. Every now and then, I mean, we have a saturated market, especially on the ERP, so if you want to grow there, how can you do that? This is like the Citroen, you know, when you want to get the rest out of it. So you have to get uh, the money basically from the allocated customer base if you cannot increase the customer base. So you see every now and then license changes. And one um, well-known thing here is the so-called indirect usage. So this indirect usage was introduced by also a large um, software company. They found out their customer has a CRM system running in the cloud via which the customers of the customer are ordering their products. So the CRM system was creating in the ERP system a sales document. This is not done by a, a sales clerk, it could be done. And it's not really done by, yeah, it's finally done by a customer, but you cannot license the customer as such because all the customers of Amazon, if you think about this 40 million customers maybe that Amazon has here, you cannot ask for a license fee for each of these customers. So the software company said, well, you have an indirect usage here and we want to have money for each document that you are submitting. Hang on, give me a break. So they ended up in court and to make the long story short, the customer lost the trial, he had to pay 60 million pound additionally license costs to the software vendor and all the other um, customers of this software vendor are somewhat really nervous because this is a real serious cost threat for them now. So this is why I say the mess around licensing costs an additional overhead where you have to take care for. And uh, I found this little charter, sorry for the quality, I cut it out of a paper. Um, the voiceev.org asks about 200 large software vendors in Europe various questions about um, their on-premise software installation. And there are three key figures which I would like to uh, point out for you. So first of all, they were asking, or second of all, is the license model okay? Roughly 40% saying, yeah, the license model is okay. But 55% say, no, sorry, the license model is not okay. Are your contracts okay? This is this one here. 32% saying, yes, the contract is okay, but 60% disagree. They are not happy with the contract. They are not happy with the license fee, potentially also not happy with the service. So if they looked at the satisfaction of the on-premise vendors, um, Cisco was basically rated highest. The customers were quite satisfied with the service and the products they're uh, receiving. And Oracle had the lowest um, satisfaction rate. And there is another key figure which I would like to point your attention to. And this is this one over here. Exit plans. So due to the fact that you're not really happy with it, do you plan to exit, not Brexit, so they stay in? Um, do you want to change your vendor and exit from there? Only 18% say, yeah, we want to do that. And about uh, 60, 70% say, no, we're not doing that. And do you think why? Can you imagine why? Anybody? Yeah, it's a vendor lock-in. You know, um, you're having this software, and the software vendor at a certain point in time has you by the neck. And it's probably a, a very high amount of money that you need to spend a, lot, a high internal effort to get out of it, right? And this is another impact of licensing. 
So, what costs nothing is nothing is definitely wrong to my understanding. So, um, free software has less features. Yeah, every project starts small. We got that in the beginning. If you think at the first Linux kernel and take a look uh, how it look how it is now, some 12 million lines of code later, of course it, it it has grown. And here in the OpenSUSE project, we have a kind of anarchy in terms of features. We have what uh, Rich once uh, phrased a so-called duocracy. Those who do decide. If you think that the community can take benefit of this or that feature, do it. Implement it, submit it, and make it available for everybody. Right? And mostly it's much easier to get new features into free software than into commercial software because of this freedom to act. Right? The free software is basically about collaboration. Get the code, modify it, improve it, and give it back. So if we're working together, we're cre creating a great system. And that's the point. The second one is that everybody of us is keen to work with open standards. Because open standards allow you as well to work on top of these standards and to gain improvements from there. So if we're talking about digitalization, Internet of Things, or something like that, that cannot work without free software. Otherwise, you're locked into this single vendor world where everything works nicely in this world. But if you look outside, if you look over the fence, you're lost. Apple is such a great example. Everything within their ecosystem is nice, but if you leave it, better not. So the interoperability between the software components is key. A good example for this is ISO 26300. Does that know anybody? Yeah, exactly, the open document format <laughs> for Office application. So this is a standard, it's a worldwide standard, and uh, if you save your stuff in ODF format, you can make sure, or you can be quite sure, that most software supports this. There is, of course, one big software vendor which does not support this. And why? They're using their proprietary solutions in order to create a vendor login. And with this solution, they are not even compliant to the um, GDPR, General Data Protection Regulations, Datenschutzgrundverordnung, as we call it in German. Because the Netherlands, the Dutch government, found out that they are submitting between 22 and 25,000 so-called service points to their servers um, somewhere in the world. Of course, they are not specifying what they are sending. They have also not asked you for permission before. So the, the law is broken a million times each day. And what scares me most is that nothing is happening. But if your little grocer store around the corner has a wrong page on, or a wrong sentence on the imprint of the west website, then you can see the strong arm of the law getting bitter. Uh, and this is, uh, this is a serious threat, I think. So on the one hand, um, you really have to make sure that you're compliant. But if other companies, uh, big companies, are uncompliant, um, then basically nothing happens. So if you want to be sure and happy with your applications, make sure that you use documents in the open document standard. Give you a nice uh, example about, uh, OK, yeah, less features. No, wrong, because we are always able to improve. To give you a nice example of this kind of collaboration is the so-called injury surveillance system. The injury surveillance system is a recording of violent injuries. That can be an accident, robbery, self-harm, sexual assault, or whatever. The whole development is ICD-10 encoded. ICD-10 is uh, an encoding system for medical uh, diagnosis. Right? It is uh, georeferenced with uh, OpenStreetMap. So you can later on identify where are your heat 
maps or you can create a heat map and find the hot spots for uh, accidents, for robberies or whatever within your country. This module was a uh, development by the Ministry of Health in Jamaica and it has then been given back to the GNU Health community. It was built into the standard and now everybody can uh, participate from it or take benefit from it. And I think this is a very positive example on how collaboration with free software is working. So, another bonbon is you're not getting fired for buying IBM, Microsoft, or SAP, or whatever major company. If things are working, nobody cares what software it is that you're working with. But as soon as you have a problem, you're of course more attackable when you have a solution which is not in mainstream. Right? And mainstream is, for example, IBM, Microsoft, SAP, whatever. So as a strong, as a CIO, you have to be quite strong in this, let's say it that way. On the other hand, you're not getting fired for buying uh, uh, uh. It's only partly true. I mean, we every, everybody of us has probably heard already about failed software implementations. And there was a big one last year. And what do you guess, how many euros did they burn on a failed software implementation? Two, five, 10, 20? Come on, give me a figure. Sorry? 700 million does not sound bad. Any, any other figure? So a, a German retail chain wanted to introduce a standard software and they burned 500 million euros before they stopped the project. And um, I don't think that uh, in this case you can say you're not getting fired for buying uh, 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 is still true. So there's still some risk. But to get the uh, software into a company, to get free software into a company, we have a problem with the tenders, respectively with the call for information. Because these are two completely different mechanics how a software gets into a company. It's push versus pull. If you have a commercial company, then the software is pushed into the company who needs it. So, oh, we want a new CRM system. So, what are requirements? Yeah, let's take a look at uh, Gartner fourth quadrant, who's in there. Yeah, we write to them and uh, wait that the information comes back. Free software doesn't work like that. For free software, you have to become active by yourself because free software is pulled into the company, right? There is mostly no project office that is receiving any calls for information and saying, hey, you sugar CRM, can you please uh, describe what, our, uh, what are your answers to our questions? No, that doesn't work that way. Right? You need to become active uh, to bring the software into your company or into this company. Other thing is uh, that uh, free software projects will probably not invite you for a decision meeting in a nice hotel in Hawaii or somewhere else. But that's a different story. <laughs> so the fact you're not getting fired for buying IBM or whatever, this is partly true. Yes. This is, as said, if you're without the mainstream, you're always getting more attackable. And if you look at the C-level, CIO, CEO, it's quite a political thing. Yeah, finally, we have the questions about the risk. Because as CIO, you're responsible basically to keep the system running and to make sure that your business can work with it. So if everything works, nobody cares. If something goes odd, if something goes wrong, if it, if it breaks, where do you put the risk? So first of all, you need to select your support partner. In the free software world, we have many companies that are providing support. For legacy or for proprietary applications, there's mostly only one company, and even if you pay a shitload amount of money to them, it doesn't necessarily say that you receive a very good service quality. Right? So, now you have the freedom to choose your support partner. 
Then finally, you need to agree on SLAs, service level agreements. It's something different whether you have uh, support uh, weekly from 9 to 5 by phone or whether you have a 7 days 24-7 um, support by uh, telephone, by internet and maybe by direct consultancy. That your SLAs have mostly, a, or they have always a direct impact on the price that you pay for the service. Finally, train the people. I mean, if you have all the service outsourced, that looks good on the first glance, but if you look behind it, uh, you just have trained the outsourcing partner and after three months, the stuff has completely changed. So the, the know-how is gone, so you start again. Right, so they're losing. They're they're solving a problem somewhere in abroad. I call it. Um, you get a solution back. You look at it and say, "Come on, that cannot be true." So you start investigating by yourself and do basically the same investigation two times: one with the external partner, one with yourself. And I mean, I've I've seen this a couple of times with outsourced service contracts. It's mostly not ideal, but it looks good in terms of management figures. So finally, make sure that you properly partner with your free software project because then you can directly influence the product quality and make sure that the patch that you've developed for this problem ends up in the next release, right? So, free software is a shift basically from a vendor-oriented approach to make sure the vendor gets enough money to a customer-centric approach. You as a community member can use your power to improve the software and the service. And with this, finally, your operation. So, the question or the, the, the risk with free software is, in my understanding, no issue. So, Let's summarize up a little bit, or let's start a summary with an estimate from, from Gartner. They said in 2011, well, 2016 open source software will be included in mission critical software portfolios within 99% of the global 2000 enterprises. And I think they're right. The reason for this is quite high software quality, we have a controlled development, and finally, you have the freedom to choose, the freedom to improve, to make sure that you get the right software partner and the right conditions for your company. Some big users of free software, for example, are IKEA. Since many, many years, they are running their retail system on, on a Linux basis. Of course, all the big ones, Google, Facebook, Amazon, are using free software and take advantage from it. Partly they're feeding back into the community, partly not. SAP has a new software release which is called HANA. And uh, this HANA runs, I will not say exclusively, but for a very large part on SUSE Linux Enterprise. Right, so if you're now getting an on-premise installation, it's for the most part uh, a, a SLE software running underneath. And as already said, Microsoft uh, makes making use of free software for themselves quite a lot, because otherwise their Azure software would not work. And do you think, or do you know what I think that the coolest gadget is that is running Linux? Any idea? Any proposal? Sorry, I still is. take the microphone. I'm hearing badly. Like cow milking machines that run on Linux? Um, somewhat. I think this one here, the Tesla, they're using Linux internally as well. I think uh, this is probably the coolest gadget. So, to make the long story short, to sum up, there is a lot of wrong. Um, wrong words about free software in the market and all of them are basically wrong. There is only one, really one mistake that you can make with free software and this is basically not to use it. And that's for today. Thank you very much. I'm happy to answer questions.
Uh, thanks. Uh, coincidentally, uh, coincidentally, I have the same thought towards proprietary software, besides some other issues. Um, have you compared that? Because, I mean, we, we can argue in the same way. We can say, like, hey, there is some geek programming this proprietary software. You don't see the people, and you don't see their code. That doesn't change anything about the people behind the project. Um, so if we compare this, uh, can you point out something and then tell people, well, actually, if you have those fears, those are exactly the fears you should have towards proprietary software, plus more. Um, yeah, this is a good question. Um, actually, I haven't compared that to, me or to, to, to check against what are the fears against proprietary, or yeah, the fears against proprietary solution, because I, I figured out or I noticed every now and then the more license fees the customers are paying, the more happy they seem to be, even though they don't really uh, get, a good, uh, get a good service back for this. This is uh, strange, but I couldn't really find out, find out what, the, what the reason for this is. Does it answer your question? Yes. Thanks. Any more questions? Okay, thanks a lot. Have a good way back.